Okay, part five, returning to this issue of hypostatic causation. Remember that I briefly uh, addressed the filioque clause. I believe that was in, uh, it was either video one or two. I mentioned the criticism that the Eastern Church has of the Roman Catholic Church, where the Catholic Church proclaims that the, the cause of the third person, the Holy Spirit, um, was affected by not just the Father, but the Father and the Son. <clears throat> and uh, the Orthodox come back and they say, well, since you have two persons engaged in causing another, then that which is doing the causing are either two different gods, two different natures, so to speak, or just a nature because whatever whatever two persons have all of them have you can't predicate something of two of the persons and not also the third you can predicate hypostatic properties you know, a unique, uh, you, can, you, can, you can predicate a unique and unrepeatable hypostatic property to a, to a specific hypostasis and not the others, but you can't, um, you can't say that two persons are in possession of something without all of them being in possession of it. So whatever multiple persons have belongs to the Trinity, which is to say that it belongs to nature. When it comes to the hypostatic properties, each of the properties is peculiar or unique to, the, to that specific hypostasis. So, for example, um, the energies belong to the nature. In other words, to all three of the persons. Since the three persons have the same nature. But each of the three hypostatic properties, which is to be uncaused for the Father, to be begotten for the Son and to be spirated for the Holy Spirit are unique to each of the three persons. Spiration is unique to the Spirit, begottenness and generation is unique to the Son, and the um, state of being uncaused is unique to the Father. It's his hypostatic property. Well, If, if you can't have two persons causing a third person, since that would be saying that an impersonal nature is causing an hypostasis, then neither can you say <clears throat> that a single person, i.e. the father, causes two other persons. You can't say, you can't do it in reverse and say that a person causes a nature. Why do I say that he's causing a nature? Well, because the, the Spirit and the Son are characterized by the attribute of being caused. So whereas the Roman Catholic Church has two principles of causation causing the third person, the Orthodox makes the same error in reverse. They have a person causing 
two principles. Well, I don't know why I said principles. The causing two persons, let's just say two persons to make it easier, that have the same thing in common, to be caused. Therefore, he's causing a nature, not two persons, not two hypostases. Remember that the dogma is that causation can only be predicated of hypostases. So only an hypostasis can cause other hypostases, and only hypostases can be caused by another hypostasis. You can't have a nature causing a person, i.e., two persons having the attribute of causing, nor can you have a person causing a nature, i.e. two persons sharing the attribute of being caused. I dare anybody to refute that. So, let's go on to video six. Which I'm still thinking about. I need to distill this down a little bit further because I've got too many notes on it. I need to clarify my thoughts on this a bit more, but I'll, I'll try. I'll get off here and uh, take care of that. It's going to um, revolve around this distinction between the hypothesis proper and its property. Um, I debated a very intelligent gentleman before I debated Jonathan Hill, who's also a very intelligent young man. Uh, his name was Adam. But he, what's interesting is that he and Hill seem to diverge on this point. Uh, Adam seemed to be saying, Adam seemed to be identifying the hypostasis with its property, whereas Jonathan Hill was distinguishing between the property and the person. So I'd like to do a thought experiment to see what happens when we do both things. What happens when we identify them? What happens when we differentiate them? 